Welcome, aviation enthusiasts and curious minds, to a journey through the skies like never before. We're about to embark on a thrilling exploration of the most unusual and innovative planes that defy the conventional norms of aviation. Originating from a design philosophy dating back to 1930, but conceived during the Second World War, the XCG-16 glider emerged as one of the most unconventional and innovative glider concepts ever tested. Initially designed for transporting heavy equipment and supplies, including vehicles and military personnel, the XCG-16 later became involved in experiments to deliver fuel to long-range bombers during flight. As a crucial element of the war effort, it showcased the capability to transport substantial loads without the need for an engine. Despite its troubled test history and eventual exclusion from production, the XCG-16's design retained its distinctive features. The roots of the XCG-16 can be traced back to May 1930, when American aero engineer Vincent Bernelli explored various lifting theories and flying wing concepts. The United States Army Air Force subsequently issued a specification calling for a novel design incorporating Bernelli's patented lifting fuselage concept. To assess the most suitable design for military use, a competition among different aircraft manufacturers was organised at Wright Field. Designers Hawley Bolas and Albert Kriz utilised Bernelli's concept as a foundation to create their own glider for the competition. Bolas, previously focused on designing leisure aircraft and recreational vehicles for the civilian market, ventured into military aircraft design for this competition. His most notable design had been the Bolas Road Chief, the trailer and caravan upon which Airstream had based their famous design. He had also worked as one of the consultants on the Spirit of St. Louis, the aircraft piloted by Charles Lindbergh, who completed the first non-stop transatlantic flight between New York and Paris. Despite lacking experience in combat and military design, Bolas moved forward with his concept, collaborating closely with Kriz and the team at his company, Bolas Sailplanes. The German military's successful use of gliders during the 1940 invasion of Belgium, particularly in landing troops in challenging areas behind Belgian lines, drew attention. Gliders played a crucial role in capturing strategic sites, exemplified by the rapid overrun of Fort Aben Amal in May 1940, where glider-borne Nazi soldiers surprised Belgian troops. While the United States initially maintained neutrality in the early stages of the war, experiences like the Battle of Fort Aben Amal prompted the United States Army Air Corps to take gliders seriously into consideration. In response to the USAC's request for a glider capable of transporting troops, heavy equipment and supplies towed behind engine-driven bombers and transport planes, Bolas and Kriz diverged from the traditional single fuselage design that characterised most American gliders. Instead, they embraced a flying wing concept, closely studying Bonelli's philosophy and incorporating their own ideas on top of it. A half-size prototype model was created in late 1942 by Bolas Sailplanes, with Bolas and his team considering the initial test results to be good. The first full-size glider prototype, named the MC-1 glider, was produced by General Airborne Transport. Following the closely followed design of the half-size model, initial factory tests once again indicated the potential of the new design. The full MC-1 design was envisioned to be larger than other gliders of its time. It was characterised by a high wing configuration with a wooden frame and fabric covering, all while retaining Bonelli's philosophy. With a wingspan of 110 feet and a length of 67 feet, the MC-1 boasted substantial dimensions. Bolas aimed for a cargo capacity of up to 15,000 pounds facilitating the transport of both cargo and troops through two large cargo doors located at the glider's front for easy access and rapid deployment during battle situations. The intended operational method involved towing the XCG-16 into the air by a C-47 or C-54 Air Force transport plane, which would then release the glider to continue its flight independently. 
the glider featured a twin boom design for the tail. Designed with spoilers, the XCG-16 could deploy them to reduce lift and increase drag, enabling rapid descent and short landings on various terrains. Additionally, the glider was equipped with retractable landing gear, deployable for landings on rough ground. The maiden flight test of the MC-1 began on the 19th of July 1943 at March Field, California. The first test run proved to be a success and was commended by military and business observers. A second test flight was scheduled at March Field on the 11th of September 1943, but this run ended in disaster. Among the crew and passengers aboard the glider were notable aviator and businessman Richard Chichester Dupont and military glider specialist Colonel Ernest Gable, who was set to pilot the MC-1 for its demonstration. During the demonstration, the glider was towed by a Lockheed C-60. Shortly after takeoff, an unintended encounter with the C-60's prop wash caused the glider to violently sway from side to side. Compounding the issue, the weight ballast inside the glider had not been properly secured and began to shift, exacerbating the rapid tilting of the XCG-16. Recognising that a crash landing was imminent, three of the passengers, including Dupont, attempted to parachute from the glider as it continued its descent. While two passengers successfully landed safely, Dupont tragically lost his life when his parachute didn't open in time. Colonel Gable remained on the glider and also lost his life when it ultimately crashed into the ground. Despite the tragic setback at March Field, Bolas continued with the design and the US military awarded a contract to the General Airborne Transport Company in November 1943 after negotiations. The contract approved the construction of three MC-1 units, two flyable and one for static tests were awarded by the USAF. The completed full-sized MC-1 gliders were also given the military designation XCG-16 and the name stuck. Only one completed XCG-16 unit was manufactured and submitted for USAC testing. Test pilots and engineers acknowledged the XCG-16's strong aerial performance, highlighting its excellent stability and manoeuvrability. However, military observers concluded that the glider fell short of expectations in terms of cargo and loading capabilities, deeming it unsuitable for combat situations. Consequently, no additional units were produced. There was initial consideration of repurposing the glider for new Air Force experiments. In 1944, the US military explored the concept of extending the range of existing transport and bomber aircraft by utilising trailing gliders to carry fuel. The XCG-16 airframe was handed over to the Cornelius Aircraft Company, known for building gliders, to modify and test the forward-swept wing design, capitalising on the XCG-16's robust capabilities. The Cornelius Company made several alterations to the glider, renaming it the XFG-1 and prepared it for a test flight. However, the first XFG-1 model crashed during a demonstration in October 1944. Although a second model was produced by Cornelius following the Bolus format, by that time the US military had lost interest in the project, leading to the discontinuation of further development. The period spanning World War II and the subsequent decade witnessed intensive aircraft development, featuring innovations like turbojet and rocket propulsion, flying wings, parasite fighters, reconnaissance planes and 10 engine bombers. Many of these endeavours proved successful, but the XF-5U-1, known as the Flying Pancake, stood out as an abject failure. The Chance Vought Division of the United Aircraft Corporation and its predecessor companies had previously supplied the US Navy and Marine Corps with successful aircraft, notably the F-4U Corsair, a highly capable carrier fighter that served in various air forces from 1942 well into the 1970s. Initiated in mid-1939, the F-5U program was spearheaded by senior designer Charles H. Zimmerman. Known for pioneering experimental designs, Zimmerman had a career with the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics and later NASA. 
His concept for the XF5U1 focused on maintaining a uniform airflow over the entire wingspan, creating a flat, disc-shaped wing fuselage. This design, resembling a pancake, was believed to allow the aircraft to take off and land at exceptionally low speeds while maintaining desirable high-speed performance, a crucial quality for Navy fighter aircraft operating from carriers. Two piston engines buried in the body on each side of the cockpit power propellers at the leading edge of the pancake. This unusual configuration gave the promise of both high and low flight speeds with high angle attitudes for landing, takeoff and other manoeuvres. The wing fuselage of the XF5U1 resembling a flying pancake featured a complex empennage that included two normal looking horizontal stabilisers and elevators, two rudders and two large elevators on the midpoint of the fuselage. In the development phase, Chance Vought constructed a quarter-scale aircraft named V-173 with a loaded weight of approximately 3,050 pounds, roughly one-fifth the weight of the full-size XF-5U-1. The V-173 made its first flight on the 23rd of November 1942, following extensive wind tunnel tests. Notably, aviation pioneer Charles A. Lindbergh and several Navy pilots piloted the V-173 during its 131 hours of successful flight tests, despite being underpowered. The V-173's unique tall undercarriage gave it a ground angle of 22.25 degrees and the pilot entered the aircraft beneath the cockpit. This setup made forward visibility almost non-existent until the tail lifted from the runway. Transparent panels were incorporated between the pilot's feet to enhance downward visibility during landings. Remarkably, the V-173 could typically take off within 200 feet and even achieve vertical takeoff into a 25-knot wind. By mid-1942, work commenced on the enlarged VS-315, which would later become the Navy's XF-5U-1. In September 1942, the Navy expressed its intent to procure two of these aircraft. For the operational XF-5U-1, designer Zimmerman aimed for a phenomenal speed range of 40 to 425 miles per hour. With improved engines and water injection, he envisioned pushing the speed range to 40 to 460 miles per hour. The engine arrangement posed significant challenges for the Chance Fort team throughout the aircraft's development programme. The propellers, which rotated in opposite directions, were attached to shafts enclosed by circular nacelles extending forward from the fuselage. In addition, because of the high angles of attack that the aircraft was intended to adopt for extended periods, careful attention had to be given to the design of the fuel and oil systems to ensure they would operate at all attitudes for indefinite periods. The XF-5U-1, generally similar in configuration to the V-173, was designed to sit at an angle of 18.75 degrees, a slightly less severe angle than the prototype but still notable. The Oleo legs featured twin small diameter wheels, which folded upward and aft into the lower fuselage surface and closed by clamshell doors. For carrier operations, an arresting hook was to be fitted, a complex assembly that retracted and was enclosed by doors. As a combat aircraft, the XF-5U-1 was equipped with 3.50 calibre machine guns on each side of the cockpit, with a magazine capacity of 400 rounds per gun. Provisions were made to replace four of these guns with four 20mm cannons. Additionally, the aircraft could carry two 1,000-pound bombs under the fuselage. A wooden mock-up of the XF-5U-1 was ready for inspection by the Bureau of Aeronautics on the 7th of June 1943 in Stratford, Connecticut. After some revisions, it gained approval in August, though the two-aircraft contract was not signed until the 15th of July 1944. The first aircraft was to be equipped with R2077 engines, rated at 1,350 horsepower for takeoff, while the second would have the XR2002 fitted with right turbo superchargers. The 16-foot diameter propellers were contra-rotating, 
turning outboard to prevent prop wash from disrupting the airflow over the wing fuselage. The first XF5U1 was rolled out of the assembly hall at Stratford in late June 1945. It began ground testing on the 20th of August, with flight testing envisioned to start a year later. The second XF5U1 will be used for static tests. The flight test schedule was delayed because of difficulty obtaining the articulated propellers, which were not available until 1947. The XF5U1 faced challenges beyond its configuration. Vibration problems and issues with the complex gearboxes added to the list of difficulties. The planned flight tests were set to take place at the Murroch Dry Lake in California. However, with the conclusion of World War II in August 1945, the US Navy underwent a thorough review of its aircraft development and procurement initiatives. The XF5U1 became an obvious target for cancellation. Apart from financial constraints in naval aviation, the Navy was actively sponsoring several fighter and attack aircraft with turboprop and turbojet engines. Consequently, the viability of a piston engine combat aircraft for future roles was highly questionable. On the 17th of March 1947, the Navy officially cancelled the XF5U1 program and issued orders to scrap the two aircraft. This action was carried out in 1948. Unfortunately, the Flying Pancake never had the opportunity to take flight. The Miles Aircraft Concern conceived the M39 Libellula during the early 1940s, amid the turmoil of World War II. Initially, the concept aimed to simplify landing aircraft on carrier decks, addressing visibility challenges caused by forward-mounted engines and large wing mainplanes. A novel tandem wing arrangement was pursued to mitigate risks, resulting in a series of concepts explored by Miles during the war. The overarching term for these Miles designs was libellula, named after the taxonomic family of the dragonfly. The groundwork for this project began with the M35, essentially a technology demonstrator for a single-seat naval fighter. Miles pursued this endeavour independently, using the tandem wing setup to reconfigure the centre of gravity found in conventionally configured military aircraft. In a brief span of six weeks, Miles engineers introduced the M35. This aircraft was equipped with a single de Havilland Gypsy Major air-cooled inline engine boasting 130 horsepower. During testing, the engine exhibited temperamental behaviour and longitudinal control was problematic. Nevertheless, this design provided valuable insights into the unconventional arrangement, contributing to future developments in the field. Building on this knowledge, a new design emerged, scaled at 5 eighths and designated as M39B. This single-seat demonstrator featured a pair of de Havilland Gypsy Major IC air-cooled inline engines, each with 130 horsepower, showcased in outboard nacelles beneath the rear wing mainplanes. The frontal mainplane was now positioned low against the sides of the cockpit, and the fuselage boasted a finely contoured shape from nose to tail. The undercarriage transitioned to a traditional tricycle configuration. Given the larger scope of the M39B project, its dimensions were appropriately increased. The wingspans now measured 25 feet at the front set and 37.5 feet at the rear. The overall length extended to 22.3 feet and the maximum weight rose to 3,200 pounds. As constructed and tested, the M39B achieved speeds of up to 166 miles per hour thanks to its twin engine setup and tandem wing approach. The maiden flight for the M39B occurred on July the 22nd, 1943. A dorsal fin was later fitted at the fuselage aft for additional control to complete the M39B's iconic three-finned appearance. Up until September of 1943, all of the work on the two aircraft, M35 and M39B, was as a private venture. From then on, the British Air Ministry decided to offer a formal development contract to Miles. Shortly after, Miles sought interest from the United States Army Air Forces, aware of their consideration of the domestic Curtis XP-55 Ascender, which shared a tandem wing pusher engine configuration and was intended as a fighter. 
The USAF's response revealed a general lack of interest in the Miles product, as the XP55 itself faced issues, particularly with stalls and recovery. The American program only progressed to flight testing, producing three aircraft in total. The M39B underwent evaluation at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, encountering problems from the outset. A new undercarriage had to be installed, and several accidents necessitated constant repairs, keeping the aircraft grounded for extended periods. Despite its unconventional arrangement, overall handling characteristics were considered normal. While landing and takeoff required adjustments to the standard routine, these were deemed forgivable and stalling and recovery performed as anticipated. In 1941, the RAF issued a new specification for a medium-class, medium-to-high altitude, high-performance bomber. Miles responded with its M39 project, a modified version of the M39B, featuring a pressurised cockpit for a crew of three. The proposed power for the M39 project included either two Rolls-Royce Merlin 61 series inline engines or three Powerjet's W2500 gas-powered turbine engines. This design featured a significant wingspan increase, measuring 37.5 feet at the frontal wing and 55.8 feet at the rear pairing. The overall length expanded to 35.9 feet and the maximum weight surged to 26,750 pounds. The envisioned cruising speed was 360 miles per hour and armament was planned to include two 20mm cannons in the wing routes, one gun per route, along with an internal bomb bay in the fuselage, capable of carrying up to 6,000 pounds of bombs. Ultimately, the de Havilland DH-99 Vampire fulfilled the specified requirements. The Hawker P-1005 also competed for a period. Although a prototype M39 high-speed bomber was ordered under a November 1943 contract, it was never constructed. The RAF's bomber needs were met elsewhere, leading to the termination of the M39 project, along with the data-collecting M39B aircraft. While surviving the war, the M39B lasted only until 1948, when it was scrapped. Despite its shortcomings, the Miles Libellula left an indelible mark on aviation history. Its bold, unconventional design inspired future aircraft engineers to think outside the box and take risks. The Libellula remains a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the boundless potential of innovation. The Miles M39B Libellula serves as a fascinating case study of a daring, experimental aircraft that ultimately fell short of expectations. Its unique design, ambitious goals and ultimate cancellation offer valuable lessons for future aviation endeavours. Conceived during the latter part of World War II, the Miles M57 Aerovan aimed to serve as an economical aircraft for transporting passengers and cargo over short distances, capable of landing and taking off from rugged airstrips. Development of the Aerovan began in early 1944 with the vision of creating a cost-effective, low-powered freighter suitable for both civilian and military applications. George Miles, throughout the Second World War, championed the adoption of such an aircraft in the British military, challenging the prevailing reliance on gliders. After completing the development of the Miles Messenger, Miles' design team recognised the potential of a more powerful and heavier aircraft, approximately double in capacity. This envisioned aircraft could serve as a robust military transport, particularly for operations like the Burma Campaign against Imperial Japan and specialised roles such as air ambulance missions. Anticipating post-war demand from civilian operators, Miles foresaw the Aerovan's popularity in the civilian market. However, the War Ministry held a different perspective, delaying the project until the conclusion of hostilities and the Victory in Europe Day celebrations on May 8, 1945. The prototype aircraft was built at the Miles factory in Berkshire, debuting on January 26, 1945. The plane featured a high wing design, a high tail and large rear clamshell doors. Miles decided that a pair of Blackburn Cirrus major piston engines would power the British-built plane. After its maiden flight, test pilot Tommy Rose gave it rave reviews for its performance. The aircraft was also capable of lifting heavy payloads, 
something Miles thought the Air Ministry would like. Constructed from plastic bonded plywood with elements of spruce and metal, the Miles Aerovan was a twin-engined high-wing monoplane. Its design featured a fixed tricycle undercarriage and three vertical tail and rudder units, resembling the Miles Messenger in its overall configuration. The wing boasted electrically actuated flaps, a recent innovation allowing adjustment to any angle. Ground steering options included both differential braking and differential operation of the throttles. The Aerovan's forward fuselage had a relatively deep-sided structure, requiring a substantial fin area. The cockpit, situated beneath a large clear perspex canopy, accommodated two pilots, while circular windows on either side of the pod-shaped fuselage provided views for passengers. Access to the cabin and cockpit was granted through a starboard side door, with additional amenities like soundproofing often included for enhanced comfort. Known for its lifting prowess, the Aerovan could carry payloads of up to one tonne, with enough space to accommodate a typical family car, loaded through rear-set clamshell doors. The standard Aerovan was powered by a pair of Blackburn Cirrus major piston engines. Alternative power plants included the de Havilland Gypsy Major and the Lycoming 0435, often necessitating the use of enlarged fins and rudders to cope with the increased power under all circumstances. By swapping the engines, the maximum speed could be increased by up to 20 miles per hour and the rate of climb by up to 50%. Work on the Aerovan was resumed shortly after Victory in Europe Day. While there was immediate demand for the type amongst civilian customers, Miles were not able to keep up with the rate of orders incoming, an outcome which aviation author Don Brown attributed to the Air Ministry's decision to place the project on hold. Diverging from the prototype, the production model of the Aerofan underwent notable changes, including an 18-inch elongation of the fuselage and the adoption of porthole windows in place of rectangular ones. In 1946, full-scale production of the Aerofan commenced, with the majority sold to civilian operators globally. While predominantly a civilian aircraft, some military interest emerged, with Israel and New Zealand among the notable customers. Despite having a license for Aerovan production in France, no such aircraft were ever manufactured in the country. In New Zealand, a single Royal New Zealand Air Force aircraft was adapted for aerial fertiliser spreading, and another for aeromagnetic survey work, though the latter proved unsuccessful. In 1957, a Mark IV model underwent research, with the Hurel Dubois High Aspect Ratio Wing becoming known as the Miles HDM 105. Production abruptly halted in late 1947 due to Miles' bankruptcy and subsequent dissolution. The idea of a jet powered seaplane fighter had intrigued military aircraft engineers since the conclusion of World War II leading to numerous attempts to bring this concept to fruition. The envisioned aircraft was to be powered by jet or rocket propulsion, possessing the capability to take off and land on water while maintaining fighter-like qualities in the air. The strategic allure of such a concept was significant. It promised a versatile fighting force with the ability to deploy anywhere globally, stationed until required, a cost-effective alternative to a lingering aircraft carrier. The rapid ascent to the skies endowed it with the capability to swiftly intercept marauding enemy forces. To address these challenges, the US Navy commissioned the development of several subsonic fighters. Valid concerns were raised, as many supersonic designs of the era exhibited drawbacks such as lengthy takeoff rolls, high approach speeds and instability, particularly problematic for carrier operations. The Sea Dart was a prototype single-seat fighter designed and built by the Convair Division of General Dynamics Corporation at San Diego, California. It was equipped with retractable skis in place of ordinary landing gear to allow it to take off and land on water, snow or sand. When stationary or moving slowly in the water, the sea dart floated with the trailing edge of the wings touching the water. The skis of the aircraft were deployed once it reached a speed of approximately 10 miles per hour during its takeoff run. Convair's Sea Dart proposal secured an order of two prototypes in late 1951 
with an additional 12 production aircraft ordered even before a prototype had taken its maiden flight. While no armament was installed on any Sea Dart, plans included fitting the production aircraft with four 20mm Colt Mark 12 cannons and a battery of folding fin unguided rockets. Four of these initial orders were redesignated as service test vehicles, and an extra eight production aircraft were promptly added to the order. The necessary power was generated by a pair of afterburning Westinghouse XJ46 WE02 turbojets, drawing air from intakes positioned high above the wings to avoid ingesting spray. In the absence of these engines for the prototypes, twin Westinghouse J34 WE32 engines with just half the power were temporarily installed. The prototype initially featured an experimental single ski, which demonstrated greater success compared to the twin ski design of the second service test aircraft. Testing with several other experimental ski configurations continued with the prototype through 1957, after which it was placed into storage. The US was not the only country to consider the hydro ski. The Saunders Row Company of the United Kingdom, which had already built an experimental flying boat jet fighter, first flying in 1947, the SRA-1, tendered a design for a ski-equipped fighter, but little came of it. In the 1950s, the US Navy considered the internal arrangements of a submarine aircraft carrier that could carry three of these aircraft. Stored in pressure chambers that would not protrude from the hull, they would be raised by a portside elevator just after the sail and set to take off on their own on a smooth sea, but catapulted aft in a higher sea. The program only reached the writing on a napkin stage for two problems were not addressed. The hold for the elevator would have seriously weakened the hull and a load of a laden elevator would also be difficult to transmit to the hull structure. Constructed at Convair's San Diego facility at Lindbergh Field, the aircraft underwent testing in San Diego Bay in December 1952. Piloted by ED Sam Shannon, an unintended short flight occurred during what was initially intended as a fast taxi run on the 14th of January 1953, with the official maiden flight taking place on the 9th of April. The fighter, powered by underwhelming engines, exhibited sluggish performance. The hydro skis, despite being extended on shock absorbing oleo legs, caused violent vibrations during takeoff and landing. Although modifications to the skis and legs somewhat improved the situation, the issue of sluggish performance persisted. The Sea Dart, equipped with J34 engines, failed to achieve supersonic speed in level flight, hindered by its pre area rule shape, leading to higher transonic drag. Consequently, the second prototype was cancelled and focus shifted to the first service test aircraft, outfitted with J46 engines that fell short of specifications. However, during a shallow dive, speeds exceeding Mach 1 were reached with this aircraft, making it the only supersonic seaplane to date. On the 4th of November 1954, Sea Dart Bu No. 135762 disintegrated in mid-air over San Diego Bay during a demonstration for naval officials in the press, killing Convair test pilot Charles E. Rishborg when he inadvertently exceeded the airframe's limitations. Even prior to this tragic event, the Navy's interest in the Sea Dart program had been waning. The crash further downgraded the program to experimental status. Consequently, all production aircraft were cancelled, though the three remaining service test examples were completed. The last two prototypes unfortunately never took to the skies. In the post-World War II era, the concept of military aircraft capable of vertical takeoff and landing VTOL, captured the imagination of designers and military strategists globally. The increasing performance of land-based jet aircraft necessitated longer runways, which in turn presented vulnerabilities. A single conventional bomb on a runway could incapacitate an airbase and its aircraft. Naval aviation faced similar challenges, as aircraft carriers were susceptible to attacks. Despite the number of combat aircraft a carrier could operate, any damage to the vessel rendered its air power ineffective. The idea of VTOL-capable aircraft emerged as a potential solution to these issues. Such aircraft could be launched and recovered from small, temporary forward airbases or even from vessels considerably smaller than traditional aircraft carriers. 
Recognizing the strategic importance of VTOL capabilities, the USAF and US Navy jointly sponsored Project Hummingbird in 1947. This project aimed to explore and study the practical application of VTOL technology, laying the groundwork for innovative designs like the Convair XFY-1 Pogo that would follow. This project was able to use data captured from Nazi Germany at the end of World War II and, in particular, design work on a projected German VTOL aircraft, the Fokker Wolf Triebflügel Jäger. The Triebflügel Jäger was a radical design concept created in 1944 in response to the increased Allied bombing of German industrial targets. Its design never went further than the creation of wind tunnel models, but the concept of a tail set of VTOL aircraft captured the interest of the US Navy. They were interested in a fighter that could be launched from any warship and even from transport ships or tankers. The prospect of equipping each US Navy ship with its own point defense interceptor led to a significant re-evaluation of the necessity for vulnerable aircraft carriers. Building on the findings of Project Hummingbird in 1948, the US Navy initiated a more detailed study and in 1949 sought the expertise of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics to assess the feasibility of developing a tail sitter VTOL interceptor. This concept, resembling the Triebflügel Jäger in some aspects, employed a conventional fuselage with an engine driving contra-rotating propellers in the nose. A successful model demonstrated the ability to take off and land vertically, seamlessly transitioning to conventional forward flight. In May 1951, the US Navy awarded contracts to both Convair and Lockheed for the production of two prototypes, each of a VTOL tail sitter fighter. Both the Convair and Lockheed aircraft were slated to be equipped with the powerful Allison T-40 engine, a development based on a pair of T-38 Allison turboprop engines arranged side by side, delivering power to a shared reduction gearbox. This marked a significant step forward in the pursuit of effective VTOL capabilities for naval interceptors. The power of the engine was estimated to be over 5,000 kilowatts. In comparison, the Pratt & Whitney radial engine fitted to the Vought F4U4 Corsair, then in service with the US Navy, provided around 1,700 kilowatts. The pilot's seat was able to rotate through 45 degrees to allow it to be used comfortably in both vertical and horizontal flight. No armament was ever fitted to the XFY-1, but this was expected to take the form of either four 20mm cannon fitted in the wings outboard of the massive propellers or a pack containing 48 folding fin unguided aerial rockets. The first XFY-1 prototype reached completion in early 1954 and underwent testing in a fixed vertical stand at Lindbergh Field in San Diego. The performance in this setting was satisfactory, prompting the decision to proceed with the next phase of development involving tethered and untethered flight testing. The second prototype was transported to NAS Moffett Field near Sunnyvale, California, where a specially designed tethered test rig was set up in the colossal Hangar No. 1. This historic hangar, originally constructed in the 1930s, once housed the US Navy airship USS Macron. The rig featured a motorized reel attached by cable to the XFY-1 propeller hub, providing a means for emergency reeling to swiftly return the aircraft to an upright position. The challenging task of determining whether the XFY-1 could actually fly fell to Lieutenant Colonel James F. Skeets Coleman, a US Marine Corps Reserve pilot and engineering test pilot for Convair. Tethered flights were conducted with assistance from Convair flight test engineer Bob McGreary, who controlled the tether mechanism, ready to pull the XFY-1 upright in case Coleman lost control. Coleman faced the daunting responsibility of testing an aircraft that was both radically different and potentially hazardous, making his role as a test pilot exceptionally challenging. In November 1954, Lieutenant Colonel James F. Skeets Coleman achieved a significant milestone by executing the first transition to horizontal flight in the XFY-1. Remaining in conventional forward flight for over 20 minutes, he safely returned the aircraft for landing. The XFY-1, powered by significant thrust in a compact and streamlined airframe, proved to be remarkably fast. Even with throttles at their minimum setting, 
the aircraft cruised at speeds exceeding 300 miles per hour. During level flight, it often surpassed the conventional chase aircraft designed to monitor its progress. The absence of speed brakes or spoilers made landing at these high speeds particularly challenging. To address this, Coleman developed a unique landing technique. Approaching the landing field at around 300 miles per hour, he would pull the stick all the way back when close to the landing point, causing the XFY-1 to enter a vertical climb. As the speed decreased, he carefully added power until the aircraft reached a hover at an altitude of around 1,000 feet. Then, while looking over his shoulder at the ground, he gently reduced power during the descent. The XFY-1's lack of stability in the hover demanded constant control corrections during descent, especially as it encountered turbulence from its own reflected prop wash near the ground. One of the most demanding aspects of landing involved judging the aircraft's rate of descent within safe limits, a task requiring the pilot's attention to the ground over his shoulder and continuous control input to maintain stability. The unique characteristics of the XFY-1 demanded exceptional skill and precision from its pilot during the landing phase. As an aid, Convair mounted a small radar altimeter pod on the left wingtip. This was connected to three lights in the cockpit. Green meant that the aircraft was in a stable hover. Amber meant that it was descending within safe limits. And red meant that the rate of descent was too fast. Even with this device fitted, the XFY-1 was a fiendishly difficult aircraft to land. Coleman was clearly an exceptional pilot and when another US Navy pilot was allowed to fly the XFY-1 for the first time in May 1955, he was lucky to survive the experience. The XFY-1 never took to the skies again, and the project officially concluded in August 1956. Lockheed's XFV-1 tail sitter II was abandoned without achieving vertical takeoff or landing. From a strictly technical standpoint, the XFY-1 demonstrated success. It executed numerous flights, showcasing its ability to fly conventionally and to perform vertical takeoffs and landings. In this limited sense, it marked the first successful military VTOL aircraft. However, as a potential operational aircraft, the XFY-1 faced insurmountable challenges. Landing safely was an exceedingly difficult task. Lacking automated flight stabilization in the hover, it demanded constant corrections from the pilot who also had to closely and continuously monitor descent rate, position and attitude. The second critical issue leading to the project's cancellation was performance. By the mid-1950s, jet interceptors capable of exceeding Mach 1 were being produced. In just a few years, operational aircraft would achieve Mach 2 capabilities. Despite the formidable power of its turboprop engine, the XFY-1 could never reach even Mach 1. This limitation placed it at a distinct and insurmountable disadvantage as a combat aircraft, making its operational viability untenable in the face of evolving technological standards. During the Cold War, the US Army was actively exploring various aviation technologies to gain an edge over the expanding threat posed by the Soviet Union. The VZ-4DA, also known as the Model 16, developed at Fort Eustis, was one such result of this era. Edmund R. Doak, the president of Doak Aircraft Company in Torrance, California, had been experimenting with ducted fans and related air-moving concepts since 1935. He proposed a vertical takeoff and landing VTOL aircraft to the US military as early as 1950. Doak successfully convinced the Army Transportation Research and Engineering Command at Fort Eustis that his VTOL aircraft could amalgamate the benefits of a conventional fixed-wing fighter with the helicopter's capacity to take off and land in confined spaces. Recognising the potential vulnerability of Allied airbases and runways to Soviet first strikes, the Army considered the ability to take off and land in small areas crucial. VTOLs, similar to helicopters, offered the advantage of lingering longer over a target, hovering and even flying backwards. In essence, the Doak Model 16 appeared to be an ideal utility and observation platform with the potential to deliver fire to ground targets. On April 10, 1956, the Army awarded Doak a contract for a single research vehicle 
initiating the development of the experimental VTOL aircraft. Only one prototype, serial number 569642, would ever be built and tested. The Doak 16's two 5-foot diameter ducted fiberglass fans were located on its wingtips. Positioned vertically for takeoff and landing, they were rotated into a horizontal attitude for normal forward flight, the first time this concept was successfully employed. A rotation speed of 4,800 RPM was required to achieve lift. To maintain a low weight, the fuselage of the Doak 16 was constructed using uncovered welded steel tubing, later covered with moulded fibreglass at the nose and thin aluminum sheeting on the aft fuselage. This modification was made when it was discovered that the open frame was hindering forward speed trials. The wings and tail, on the other hand, were made of metal. Edmund R. Doak demonstrated resourcefulness in cost-cutting measures, incorporating the landing gear from a Cessna 182, seats from a North American F-51, and duct actuators from Lockheed T-33 electric flap motors. The two-place tandem cockpit could accommodate a pilot and observer, with standard stick and rudder controls for the pilot. The aircraft's empty weight was 2,400 pounds, and its gross weight was 3,300 pounds. It had a wingspan of 25 feet 7 inches, measured 32 feet in length, and stood 10 feet 1 inch high. By 1958, the Doak 16 had undergone multiple test flights at Torrance Municipal Airport. Its first hovering flight took place on February 25, 1958, and on May 5, 1959, the prototype achieved its first conversion from vertical to horizontal flight, and vice versa. The Doak 16 completed 50 hours of flight testing, including 32 hours on a test stand, 18 hours of tethered hovering and taxiing. Throughout this process, some undesirable flight characteristics emerged, such as the aircraft's tendency to nose up during the transition from hovering to forward flight, and a short takeoff and landing performance that fell below expectations. But engineers believed these problems were all solvable. Transferred to Edwards Air Force Base in October 1958, the Doak 16 underwent another 50 hours of testing, in the course of which it logged some promising performances. The VTOL single 825 horsepower Lycoming T53 L1 turbine power plant gave it a maximum speed of 230 miles per hour, a cruising speed of 175 miles per hour, and range of 250 miles. A T-box on the engine transmitted power to the ducted fans through a 4-inch tubular aluminum shaft and two smaller steel shafts. The aircraft's service ceiling was 12,000 feet, and it had a flight endurance of one hour. These performance attributes led to its acceptance by the Army in September 1959. Officially designated the VZ-40A, the prototype was then transferred to NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia for further testing. In late 1960, a recession in the aerospace industry prompted Edmund Doak to lay off 90% of his employees. During this period, Douglas Aircraft took over the VZ-40A project by purchasing the patent rights and engineering files. Four Doak engineers were also hired by Douglas to continue their work at El Segundo. They implemented a larger engine and made structural improvements. However, after three more years of testing, the Army withdrew the VZ-40A from active trials. NASA subsequently acquired it in 1973, and it was later transferred to Fort Eustis, where it remained in storage for a time. The demise of the VZ-40A as a viable Army aircraft can be attributed to the evolving preferences within the Army. As the helicopter emerged as the Army's preferred mode of transport during the Doak 16's development, the focus shifted to funding rotorcraft, leading to a reduced emphasis on unconventional prototypes, including the VZ-40A, which were previously under consideration for production. The changing strategic priorities within the Army contributed to the discontinuation of the VZ-40A as an active military aircraft. In the early years of the Cold War, with military airfields deemed vulnerable to Soviet missile attacks, 
the concept of underground airports gained traction among Western governments. The rationale was that subterranean bases would offer better protection against enemy assaults and could potentially serve as hangars and launch sites for future stealth aircraft. However, the development of underground airports required the simultaneous creation of high-speed aircraft with vertical takeoff and landing VTOL capabilities, as traditional jets rely on runways and open skies for takeoff. One early attempt to build such an aircraft was made by the Canadians. The Avro car emerged from a series of blue sky research projects led by designer Jack Frost, who joined Avro Canada in June 1947 after gaining experience with several British firms. At the time, Frost was particularly focused on jet engine design, seeking ways to enhance the efficiency of the compressor without complicating the simplicity of the turbine engine. During the 1950s, Jack Frost initiated the ambitious Project Y with the aim of developing a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, capitalizing on his newly designed high power engine. This project represented a forward-looking exploration into VTOL capabilities, aligning with the broader interest in unconventional aircraft designs during the Cold War era. The innovative design featured the redirection of thrust through ducts along a distinctive delta wing, reminiscent of a spade on a playing card. Despite encountering financial constraints and skepticism from the military, Frost persevered in his experimentation, he explored the Quanda effect to enhance the VTOL capabilities, seeking a more practical solution for the project. Although Project Y secured funding from the Canadian Defence Research Board in the US, the Avro car, a project initiated by designer Jack Frost at Avro Canada, faced eventual cancellation due to safety issues encountered during testing. The concept of the aircraft went beyond conventional boundaries aiming to create a supersonic large disc fighter with the unique capability of performing vertical takeoffs and landings. The project reflected the era's challenges and aspirations in pushing the limits of aeronautical innovation. To gather flight data on the basic concept while engine development continued, Frost proposed the construction of a smaller proof-of-concept test vehicle in 1958, which he named the Avro car. Simultaneously, the US Army was engaged in various experiments involving smaller vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, envisioning them as flying jeeps. The Army became interested in Avro's concept, and Frost pitched the smaller design as a prototype suitable for the Army's needs and an aerodynamic testbed for the WS606 engine. Initial performance requirements for the Avro car included a 10 minute hover capability in ground effect and a 25-mile range with a 1,000-pound payload. Avro secured a $2 million joint services contract for the construction and testing of two Avro cars, designated by the Army as VZ-9AV. The Army expressed significant interest in the Avro car program, considering it a potential replacement for helicopters. However, safety concerns during testing eventually led to the cancellation of the project highlighting the difficulties in realising unconventional and ambitious aircraft concepts during that period. Additional Air Force funding, approximately $700,000, was allocated to the project from the 606A programme. In March 1959, a $1.77 million contract was secured for a second prototype. Despite setbacks, including the cancellation of the Avro CF-105 Arrow programme in 1959, the Special Projects Group at Avro Canada continued its work on the Avro car, with renewed involvement from company leadership. The USAF project office initially recommended cancelling the WS-606A and related work, but an extensive effort, led by Jack Frost, resulted in the authorization to continue the flying saucer programs in May 1959. The Avro car, notable for its disc-shaped design reminiscent of a frisbee, featured an 18-foot diameter and a thickness of 3.5 feet. Supported by a robust equilateral triangle truss, its distinctive element was the 124-blade turbo rotor, centrally positioned and powered by three Continental J69 T9 jet engines. The airframe, predominantly constructed from aluminum, had an empty weight of 3,000 pounds. The initial undercarriage included three small castoring wheels, later replaced by skids during testing. 
Piloting the Avro car involved a single side mounted control stick, enabling conventional pitch, roll and yaw control through adjustments in airflow. The attitude thrust control system, positioned outside the main disc, facilitated changes in vertical lift and directional control. To counteract inherent instability during forward flight, a mechanical stability augmentation system was implemented. The Avro car's unique design and control mechanisms aim to address the challenges of achieving vertical takeoffs and landings while ensuring stability during different flight phases. Leveraging the turbo rotor's significant angular momentum, it functioned as a powerful gyroscope, stabilizing the craft. The crew compartment accommodated two individuals in separate cockpits integrated into the airframe. Practical testing initially involved a single pilot, with occasional flights featuring an observer in the secondary cockpit. Addressing control intricacies, Avro test pilots honed a nuanced understanding of the craft's sensitive inputs. Chief Development Test Pilot Potocci achieved a hands-off flight after resolving control issues, marking a notable advancement. However, despite progress, Avro test pilot Peter Cope, USAF project pilot Walter J. Hodgson, and NASA's Ames Research Center chief test pilot Fred J. Drinkwater III all emphasized the persistently challenging nature of the Avro car. Drinkwater likened flying it to balancing on a beach ball. The first Avro car, 587055, faced hover issues due to exhaust mixing and limited lift, leading to modifications. The second, 594975, encountered uncontrollable roll and pitch oscillations during tethered hover attempts, attributed to the hub capping effect, prompting numerous modifications. Despite improvements, nozzle control issues and stability problems persisted. A new design with separate hover and forward flight controls in 1960 demonstrated better control but maintained pitch instability. Further modifications in 1961 improved hover control, allowing speeds up to 100 knots, but pitch instability persisted. A second evaluation in June 1961 revealed control problems and limited flight above critical altitudes. Before modifications could be implemented, funding ran out in March 1961. Despite Frost's proposals for a modified design, the Avro car and related WS606A supersonic VTOL programs were officially cancelled in December 1961 by the US military. The VZ9AV Avro car and its nascent VTOL technology are credited with paving the way for the development of subsequent VTOL capable aircraft, such as the AV8B Harrier II, V22 Osprey, F22 Raptor, and others currently employed in various missions by the US military. Despite its challenges, the Avro car played a significant role in advancing vertical takeoff and landing technology, contributing to the evolution of modern VTOL aircraft. The Ryan XV5 Vertifan was an experimental jet-powered VSTOL vertical short takeoff and landing aircraft developed in the 1960s. The United States Army commissioned the Ryan VZ11RY in 1961, later redesignated as the XV5A in 1962. This initiative was part of the Army's exploration of VSTOL capabilities, alongside the Lockheed VZ10 Hummingbird, which was later redesignated as the XV-4 in 1962. The XV-5 was equipped with two General Electric J85 GE-5 turbojets, each providing 2,658 pounds of thrust. Vertical takeoff and landing VTOL capabilities were achieved through the use of General Electric X3535 lift fans integrated into the wings and a smaller fan in the nose. These lift fans were powered by engine exhaust gas. Each wing featured a 62.5 inch diameter lift fan with a hinged cover on the upper wing surface, which could be open for VTOL operations. The 36 inch nose fan played a role in pitch control, but posed challenges in terms of handling characteristics. The lift fans collectively generated vertical lift of approximately 16,000 pounds which was nearly three times the thrust produced by the turbojets. Yaw control was facilitated by a set of louvered vanes beneath each wing fan, enabling the vectoring of thrust fore and aft. 
The XV-5 Vertifan was a part of the Army's exploration of innovative VS toll technologies during the 1960s, showcasing unique lift fan configurations for vertical takeoff and landing. The engine power setting determined the lift from the fans, as fan RPM was determined by the exhaust output from the J85 engines and the load on the fan. Roll control was by differential actuation of the wing fan exit louvers. Aircraft performance was subsonic, with delta wings superficially similar to those on the Douglas A4 Skyhawk. The Vertifan had an unusual intake position above the two-seat side-by-side seating cockpit and a T-tail. The XV-5A was painted in army green, while the XV-5B had a white NASA colour scheme. Despite its unique design, the lift fans on the XV-5 didn't generate the anticipated thrust and the transition between vertical and horizontal flight proved to be challenging and abrupt. This aircraft marked one of the last crewed endeavours by Ryan, a company that shifted its focus to drone manufacturing in the mid-1960s. The XV-5 was part of a diverse array of attempts to create successful vertical takeoff aircraft. However, the lift fan system used in the XV-5 was heavy and occupied a considerable internal volume. Only the Hawker Sidley Harrier remained operational by the turn of the 21st century, along with technology enabling the use of a shaft-driven fan in the Lockheed Martin F-35B. The combination of the J85 engine and lift fan in the XV-5 was a precursor to developments that led to the first high bypass ratio engine by General Electric, the TF-39. The lift fans were driven by turbine blades, mounted around the fan's periphery, with a mass flow 13 times greater than that of the gas generator and resulting in a threefold increase in thrust compared to a propelling nozzle. Following the demonstration that large volumes of air could be moved through a lift fan, an 80-inch tip drive fan, turned through 90 degrees and powered by a more potent J79 engine, was constructed to showcase an efficient cruise fan. This concept of a large diameter cruise fan was incorporated into the General Electric TF-39 engine utilised on the Lockheed CF-5 Galaxy. The XV-5, while not achieving widespread success, played a role in advancing lift fan technology and contributing to subsequent developments in aircraft propulsion. Two 12,500-pound XV-5As were evaluated in late 1966 by 15 test pilots. One was destroyed in a crash during a public flight demonstration on the 27th of April 1965, killing Ryan test pilot Lou Everett. As a result of this accident, the conversion switch was changed to a lift-lock toggle and relocated on the main instrument panel, ahead of the collective lever control. The XV-5 presented challenges during landing due to various factors. Your control relied on altering the angle of the lift fans in opposing directions, but this method proved insufficient for precise low-speed handling. The duct doors further complicated control, causing significant pitch changes even at low speeds. Additionally, the aircraft experienced poor acceleration during standard runway takeoffs. Promotional materials and tests explored the potential of a rescue version equipped with a winch to hoist individuals into a compartment behind the pilots. However, a tragic incident occurred on October 5, 1966, during trials for the rescue aircraft. The second XV-5 sustained extensive damage when a suspended horse-collar survivor sling was drawn into a wing fan. Despite the fan still functioning well enough for controlled flight, Major David H. Tittle, the pilot, suffered fatal injuries due to the ejection seat propelling him out of the aircraft after it hit the concrete airport surface. Following the accident, the second aircraft was reconstructed as the modified XV-5B and testing continued until 1971. An XV-5B is currently on display at the United States Army Aviation Museum in Fort Novacell, Alabama. Despite the cancellation of the program, the ducted fan concept was deemed successful, leading to several proposed follow-up programs. The ducted fans were recognised for their quiet operation, especially for the era, and their ability to operate from standard surface materials without causing damage. This set them apart from other VTOL aircraft, which often require protective mats to prevent ground surface damage from their exhaust, a concern mitigated by the cooler exhaust from ducted fans. 
The Grumman X-29, an experimental aircraft featuring a forward-swept wing design, marked a significant breakthrough in aeronautical innovation. Prior to the X-29, various attempts had been made to explore the concept of forward-swept wings, including NACA's wind tunnel tests in 1931 and the German Junkers Ju-287 during World War II. However, these experiments faced challenges related to aeroelasticity, as the available technology and materials were inadequate to prevent wing deformation. The turning point came in the early 1960s, with the development of the Hansajet HFB320 by Hamburger Flugzeugbau in Germany. This civilian jet, certified in 1964, became the first aircraft with forward-swept wings to use them successfully. The key to overcoming aeroelastic issues was the utilisation of lightweight and exceptionally strong composite materials, which became available in the 1970s. These materials allowed for the construction of wings that could resist deformation under aerodynamic forces. In this context, the Grumman X-29 emerged as a groundbreaking experimental aircraft that validated the feasibility of forward-swept wings. The X-29's design aimed to explore the advantages and challenges associated with this wing configuration. Despite initial scepticism, the X-29 demonstrated remarkable efficacy and became an unexpected success in aviation history. Its innovative design and successful flight tests contributed valuable insights to the field of aeronautics. In the 1970s, the emergence of composite materials, which were extremely light but stronger than conventional materials, further encouraged engineers to pursue this unusual line of inquiry. In 1977, the Defense Advanced Research Project, DARPA, together with the US Air Force Flight Dynamics Laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, authorized a program to study this novel wing concept and to confirm with scientific precision the findings of other studies, which had claimed it led to better control and lift qualities during extreme maneuvers, that it reduced aerodynamic drag, and that it flew more efficiently at cruise speeds. The Grumman X-29 project marked a significant development in aviation, with Grumman Corporation being selected as the project lead in December 1981 and receiving $87 million to produce two prototypes. The official unveiling of the X-29 took place on August 27, 1984, at the Grumman facility in Culverton, New York. Grumman Corporation President George M. Skirler emphasised the aircraft's importance in expanding the frontiers of manned flight and investigating new technologies for future generations of more agile, fuel-efficient and cost-effective tactical aircraft. Key specifications of the X-29 included a length of 16.44 metres, a height of 4.26 metres, an empty weight of 6,260 kilograms and a maximum weight of 8,074 kilograms. The aircraft was powered by a single General Electric F404 GE400 engine, enabling it to achieve a top speed of Mach 1.87, a range of 560 kilometers, and a maximum altitude of 50,000 feet. The X-29's design and capabilities were geared towards exploring new technologies in flight, contributing valuable insights to the advancement of future aircraft. This project represented Grumman's commitment to pushing the boundaries of aviation and embracing innovative solutions for improved performance and efficiency. The X-29's aeroelastic tailored wing added even more stabilization by preventing structural divergence from happening within the flight envelope. Moreover, some measure of artificial stability was added by an electronic triple redundant digital fly-by-wire flight control system, which made up to 40 commands per second to adjust the control surfaces where necessary, since the wing design was naturally highly unstable. The Grumman X-29 featured several innovative design elements aimed at enhancing its flight control and aerodynamic performance. The use of forward canards positioned in front of the wings served as primary flight control surfaces, primarily providing pitch control. Additionally, strake flaps located on either side of the rudder contributed to pitch control. Roll control, on the other hand, was achieved through flaperons, which were a combination of flaps and ailerons, modifying the wing camber. 
The wing trailing edge actuators responsible for controlling camber were intentionally mounted externally in streamlined fairings due to the thinness of the supercritical airfoil. The supercritical airfoil itself, a component first developed in the 1970s with F-8s, had a flatter upper wing surface to reduce the power of incoming shock waves, resulting in decreased drag. To optimize costs, the X-29 utilized undercarriage components borrowed from the F-16, including anti-skid tires and carbon brakes. The fuselage and nose wheel were sourced from F-5As, with one previously serving in the USAF and the Norwegian Air Force. In September 1984, the number one X-29, after routine taxi tests, had its F-404 engine removed, was protected with a blanket, and transported via ship from Bayonne, New York, through the Panama Canal to San Pedro, California. From there, it was taken to Edwards Air Force Base. On December 14, 1984, the first version of the X-29 commenced Phase 1 flight testing. Throughout 242 test runs, Evaluators observed that at moderate angles of attack, the wingtips didn't stall due to the air moving over the forward wing inwards rather than outwards. These flight tests provided valuable insights into the aircraft's aerodynamic behavior and performance characteristics. Accident-free flights also revealed the merits of the stabilization measures put into place to counteract the highly unstable forward-swept wing with pilots consistently reporting good handling characteristics. In fact, one such pilot, Chuck Sewell, enjoyed flying it so much that during the opening round of test flights, he asked ground control permission to enter it into a roll. On May 23, 1989, the second version of the X-29 commenced Phase 2, consisting of 120 flights. The primary objective of this phase was to explore the high angle of attack characteristics of the aircraft and assess potential military applications of a forward-swept wing configuration. While the number 1 X-29 had operated at a 21-degree angle of attack, the number 2 was flown at a significantly higher 67 degrees. Surprisingly, the aircraft exhibited exceptional maneuverability and control that exceeded all expectations, surpassing predictions from computer models. At 45 degrees, the X-29 displayed excellent control characteristics and even at the extreme angle of 67 degrees, it retained limited controllability. This unexpected phenomenon was attributed to the forward-swept wing design. Notably, the aircraft demonstrated effortless control without the need for leading edge flaps on the wings to provide additional lift. Additionally, there was no requirement for movable vanes on the engine's exhaust nozzle to alter thrust direction under such conditions. These findings highlighted the remarkable performance capabilities of the forward-swept wing configuration. Although the X-29 hadn't reduced aerodynamic drag as previous studies had attested, it did show the benefits of several novel devices, such as the aeroelastic tail and the close-coupled canard for longitudinal control, while proving possible that with the right design, high angle of attack control could be achieved. It was this last breakthrough that would persuade policymakers to employ it in one last experiment. In 1992, the No. 2 Grumman X-29 was enlisted by the Air Force to participate in a program exploring the implementation of Vortex Flow Control VFC, at a high angle of attack to maintain control, overriding normal flight control systems. The X-29 underwent modifications, incorporating two high-pressure nitrogen tanks linked to small nozzle jets in the forward upper portion of the nose. The purpose was to pump air into the vortices generated off the nose during high angles of attack. The modified X-29 engaged in a series of over 60 flights between May and August 1992 to assess the practicalities of VFC. The system, previously tested at the Air Force's Wright Laboratory, demonstrated that injecting air into the vortices altered their flow direction generating the forces necessary to change the nose's direction. This became particularly advantageous at higher angles of attack, where traditional control surfaces like the rudder lost effectiveness. The assessment revealed that VFC allowed the aircraft to move left and right with relative ease at higher angles of attack, compensating for the limitations of conventional control surfaces. However, VFC had its drawbacks, it couldn't impose control on the presence of side winds, 
and it didn't eliminate consistent oscillation. Currently, the second X-29 is on display at the Dryden Flight Research Centre, while the first is exhibited at the Air Force Museum. We have an ejection, we have an ejection. The aircraft is descending over the North Base area. I have a shoot. The pilot's out of the seat and the shoot is good. We had a highly competent team, very experienced many flights under their belt. We had a number of pilots that flew the airplane. The pilot in particular that was flying that day had been on the program from the very beginning, highly experienced uh, with the X-31. Each mishap has its own set of circumstances and its own sequence of events. But you find similar issues, communications, complacency, assumptions that haven't been warranted, human frailties. And you have to account for these things in a program. This is like a chain. You make a chain when you have any of these accidents, a chain of events. Any link of the chain, if it were broken, you would not have an accident. This was the A-Team. We had the best people from every discipline, from every organization, and we lost an airplane. So if it can happen to the best team, it can happen to any team. The X-31 research effort began in the late 1980s as an international program involving DARPA, the U.S. Navy, Deutsche Aerospace, the German Federal Ministry of Defense, and Rockwell International. The program's goal was to explore the tactical utility of a thrust-vectored aircraft with advanced flight control systems. Uh, the X-31 was a real pioneering program and in fact, the X-31 program pretty much wrote the book on thrust vectoring along with its sister program, the F-18 HARV. The initial X-31 flight tests were conducted at Rockwell's facility in Palmdale, California. But in 1992, NASA and the U.S. Air Force joined the X-31 research team and the test flight program was moved to the Dryden Flight Research Center on Edwards Air Force Base. And before too long, the X-31 was turning in some extremely impressive results. By any measure, the X-31 was a highly successful program. It regularly flew several flights a day, accumulating over 550 flights during the course of the program with a superlative safety record. And yet, on the 19th of January, 1995, on the very last scheduled flight of the X-31's ship number one, disaster struck. This particular flight had been on the books for 
some time to get done, and it was, by our standards, an absolutely routine flight. We were not expanding the envelope. We were not trying anything new. We were flying a new pedostatic tube, but this was in a routine uh, mission, a routine task, routine flight environment with an experienced pilot and experienced crew. But while the flight was routine, there had been some changes to the configuration of the X-31 since its initial flights. In particular, the original PITO tube, which supplies airspeed information to the plane's flight control computers, had been replaced with another kind of PITO tube, known as a Keel Pro. The Keel Pro gave more accurate airspeed data at high angles of attack, but it was more vulnerable to icing, especially since the Keel probe on the X-31 did not have any pito heat. We were never to fly an airplane in ice. That was a prohibited maneuver. So if you're prohibited from flying in ice, you don't need a heater. Normally, the conditions at Edwards are warm and dry enough that icing or pito heat isn't a concern. But January 19, 1995 was not a normal day. The unusual part of the day was we had a uh, high humidity at altitude actually conducive for freezing conditions. Uh, and an airplane uh, was operated for in and out of some fairly high moisture content for extended periods of time. Uh, led to some indications in the cockpit in the control room that it was causing problems with the air data system. This particular airplane had a limit uh, to not fly through clouds, through visible moisture. That day, uh, we were flying very close to and occasionally in and out of very thin cirrus cloud. Uh, it didn't particularly worry me because uh, everything seemed to be going along quite normally. But some minutes, like five, before the airplane went out of control and the pilot jumped out, the pilot observed that there was some moisture around where he was. So he turned the pitot heat switch on. Now clearly when he turned the pitot heat switch on, he expected that the pitot heat would be working. About uh, two and a half minutes later, which is two and a half minutes before the accident, uh, he mentioned that fact to the control room. Okay, remind me I first put the pitot heat on. Remind me to put it off. Copy that. Okay, we know. ready? The Tito heat not hooked up on a kill probe. Hooked up on Mysteriously, to this day, the control room gave him no response. They had an internal discussion as time, the clock clicked down, and internally it was commented that the pedo heat was not hooked up. But this vital piece of information was not relayed to the pilot for more than two minutes. And even when it was, the information was not stated as clearly or strongly as it could have been. And the pedo heat. Well, I'll leave it on for a moment. Yeah, we think it may not be hooked up. It may not be hooked up. That's good. I like this. We had side discussions that should have been going on on the intercom so that everybody in the control room was part of the conversation. Instead, we'd pulled our headsets aside so that we could talk to each other because we we're sitting adjacent to each other. And that's another part of just control room discipline that, that we broke down on. Meanwhile, the first signs of trouble were beginning to appear. So now... The pilot uh, sees an anomaly in his airspeed. He's at 20 degrees angle of attack, and he can see that. And he says to the ground, and I briefed this many times, he said, I'm at 277, I mean 207 knots. And in the airspeed is off, uh, I'm reading 277 knots, that's 20 AOA. Okay, pitch up this. Well, anybody that's been on the program, and there are lots of people have been on many years, would know that 20 degrees angle of attack is somewhere around 135 knots, 140 knots, doesn't matter. It's not 207 knots. Apparently, no one in the control room caught the possible significance of that discrepancy. And perhaps even more importantly, neither did the chase pilot, for the simple reason that he couldn't hear any of the pilot's transmissions. We had a, a mechanism of hot mic 
very important to the pilot in the X-31 that he be able to talk to the control room without having to press buttons at certain key times, especially at high angle attack, which was not going to be a factor in this flight because he was going to go to about 20 degrees angle attack. But it was a general operating procedure that was compounded because our hot mic system didn't work always very well. And when it didn't work, it put a lot of static in the earphones of the chase pilot who wanted to hear the hot mic to know what's going on. So it was the one-sided nature of the communication that kept me from having the situational awareness to be able to step in and say, hey, I'm reading X knots uh, and you guys are reading Y knots and these two numbers should be the same and they're not. The X-31 did indeed have an air data problem. The unheated keel probe had frozen over in the cool, moist conditions, causing it to start giving incorrect airspeed information to the X-31's flight control computers. In terms of the accepted risk, the failure of the pitot-static system or damage to it was well known. It was well understood. The pilot himself had simulated the failure in simulations before we even got the airplane. And it probably helped him understand that he had to get out of the airplane because the time is short when the airplane is diverging. And we went through quite a thorough review of, of the hazards uh, that we knew or could come up with based upon the design of the, uh, the flight control system. And we thought we had a good handle on that. We thought we could lose the whole nose boom. We could take a bird strike, wipe out the whole nose boom, and fly home safe. As a result of that, we thought we had a pretty robust system. The reason the team thought they had a robust system was the X-31's flight control system was designed with three backup reversionary modes the pilot could select in the event of an air data problem or other systems failures. So in the case of if you saw something that was not right or the control room saw something that was not right with respect to the airspeed system, they could tell the pilot to go to R3 R3 was a reversionary mode that would have removed within two seconds the airspeed data inputs into the flight control system. The control surface response to pilot inputs would then be independent of airspeed, allowing the airplane to remain controllable for the remainder of the flight back to the landing. The accepted risk was probably reasonable, but here's the kicker. The consequences of a failure are so high here that you really needed to put some special attention on this. The designer did by putting R3 in. But nobody on the test team, including the pilot, realized that the X-31 was experiencing an air data problem that would require implementing the R3 reversionary system. For several minutes, we had indications that the airspeed was becoming poor, both in the cockpit and the control room. In, the, in our last ditch catch, nobody stood up and yelled, wait a minute, this can't be right. Because had we realized what was going on, the, the control system had the ability to go to fixed flight control gains. And it, with fixed flight control gains, it would not have been a problem. They would have been able to land the airplane safely. Uh, but we just never got enough information to, to make the decision to do that. We had an alternate airspeed indicator that used a different pitot tube which would be less susceptible to icing than this special tube. It was at the pilot's right-hand knee, and he never looked at it. We had a lack of attention to the reversionary modes. Gradually, we were not thinking. We learned to depend on the control room. They're going to tell us when we need to go to R2 or R1 or R3. We need to know as pilots, which we kind of forgot, where are the safety nets? The safety nets pushed the right button, didn't get the test data, but you bring the aircraft back. So if you didn't understand uh, what was happening, uh, we should have been constantly reminded, push the button and talk about it. Pilot obviously wasn't concerned. He was as experienced probably, if you look at the control room, the pilot and everybody involved in that day's activity, he was the most experienced X-31 in the in, the, in that day's activity. He had been on a program since Palmdale. So he, he, had a, a, he noticed something, but he wasn't concerned. So, and he didn't ask for help that I was aware of. Uh, and so I think the control room 
said, well, he's not that panicked. I'm not that panicked. And I think that fed off each other a little bit. The team moved on to the final test point of the day, a simple automatic control response test that required only a command from the pilot to initiate. But once again, the airplane did not respond as expected. He hits the box, presses the button, and he says, I don't get anything. Well, he didn't get anything because the box was designed not to put any input if you went beyond a certain speed, like 200 knots. So it was seeing the false airspeed of 200 plus knots. And it, when he pushed the button, it didn't work. Three, two, one, go. What? Doesn't do anything. But it didn't work because something was wrong. And the control room came back and finally just kind of ignored that and said, it's all okay, you know, RTB now. It's almost like expecting to hear that went fine. You know, after this program with hundreds of flights and everything going perfectly, in your mind, you're hearing things that weren't happening. Everything's fine, worked fine, let's come home. The normal operation of the system was expected that the, the system would identify the problems itself, that it would not be the people on the ground identifying an air data problem and calling for fixed gains. Although it was certainly capable of putting that, the expectation would be that the system would do its own self-diagnosis and identify failures. But the failure we had was a slow failure of the tube, slowly building the ice up. So the changes in the speed were within perfectly reasonable numbers for a real airplane. Software is just not capable of detecting that failure uh, for that system. There was one or two people that actually knew that there was these little tiny areas that, yeah, it couldn't handle it, but that word never got out. They never stood up and said, oh, boss, that's not quite right. You know, uh, you can handle it over 95 or 99% of the area, but there's really a couple little areas the automated system can't handle it. And that didn't come out till after the accident. Uh, I never did get to talk to them about it, but I just kind of felt they they didn't want to stop the program, thought it was of no real issue because uh, of the difficulty of getting to such a small area of the envelope. But as the X-31 began to descend on its return to base, the problems caused by the failure of its air data system became far more pronounced. We have frozen the pitot tube now, and it's stuck. It's got what it had in it, and it's going to hold that that pressure. Now when you start down with a frozen pitot tube, the, the airspeed, what you see, the false airspeed that he saw, will decrease as he decreases altitude. But we are seeing, we, the control room is seeing, they have a big display, this big. The pilot is seeing every time he turns his head, he's seeing the airspeed in the HUD. And now it's perhaps at one point, it's at 150 knots. It cannot be at 150 knots. And then it's at 100 knots. And it cannot be at 100 knots. And going on down, it finally, right just before the accident, it gets to you know, 48 knots, which is the minimum it's going to read. But the control system in the airplane is getting this wrong information and this is a complex closed loop system. And when you put too much gain in, it will start to get unstable and it will start moving the controls, which it did a matter of seconds. And finally, it dramatically pitches up. The pilot, of course, tries to prevent that. And I'm sure the instant that he hit the forward stop and realized he, he was out of control, he did the natural thing was eject from the airplane. We were uh, RTB, return to base. And I started to rejoin on the X-31. Uh, as I came up on his right side, about uh, 100 yards away and closing, I saw the airplane start to go into a small wing rock that progressively got larger and larger. And uh, as I got within about 200 feet of him, the airplane pitched up uh, vertical. And uh, approximately the time that I passed a beam him, I saw the, uh, the pilot eject. Okay, NASA one, we have an ejection. We have an ejection. That's one, do you read? Now we copy, Dana, we copy. And sport, NASA. 
G584 has uh, ejected the aircraft and descending over the north base area. I have a shoot. Fortnite's 850, I'll hear you. 850, Yes, sir, that's uh, 584 has ejected from his aircraft. The aircraft is descending north of North Base. The pilot is in the shoot at this time, descending uh, approximately one mile north of North Base. So there was there was the knowledge and training in the simulation that taught the pilot to that he, when he started seeing the airplane was oscillating was not controlled he knew that he had to get out of the airplane very fast or else the airplane would go into a tumble and he did do that and that saved his life I also know that the pilot as he was ejecting from the airplane had thoughts of maybe I should have tried a reversionary mode. Um, but at that point, if he would have hesitated any longer, he would have been probably lost with the airplane. So. I did not connect until after the plane departed. And while the plane was tumbling, I made the connection. The pedo system had to be frozen and just didn't come to the realization soon enough to, to do anything about it in the control room. Less than four minutes after the first comment about pedo heat was recorded between the pilot and the control room, the X-31 crashed just north of Edwards Air Force Base. How could such a routine operation have ended in disaster when flights with far higher risk had been completed safely? And more importantly, what can we learn from the answers to that question? Every person involved in an experimental flight research program should actually study the mishaps of all experimental aircraft uh, in the past 20 to 30 years. There's a lot of things you can learn because human nature doesn't change, the processes don't change. It's always the same set of contributing factors, just the names and the details change. Of the 10 things, for example, that I uh, describe as causes, contributing causes of the mishap, six of them occurred prior to the day of flight. Four occurred within about two minutes. So we had a better chance of working on the six than we did on the four. In some senses, the X-31 accident started six years earlier when the plane was first developed and tested at Rockwell. We, we had a hazard analysis from the initial design. Uh, and in the accident, that had to actually get dusted off. You should never have to dust off one of those. Everybody familiar with the program, that all those levels need to have a really good, comfortable feeling of what those hazards are and uh, what is accepted in the risk. Uh, there was a redo of that analysis as we moved to NASA in 92. And I think uh, I, and it was clear after the accident, not everybody really understood what that design was to the detail you needed to to understand the full risk of the program. Clearly, uh, from 1990 to 95, you have a large team churn turnover. We changed locations. We expanded the objectives of the program. And as time rolls on and the new people come in, not everybody uh, has the same understanding or appreciation of the kind of vehicle we're operating. It's a special airplane. It's not the same risk as any other airplane. And to operate it every day, you really ought to have the same appreciation for the risk. And I don't think we as a team did a good job of keeping everybody that came to the program with the same level of understanding of both the design and the risk on the airplane. We shouldn't have had a control room, a pilot and a team that day that didn't understand that fundamental fact. And it's not elaborate, it's just straightforward. The airspeed I see in the HUD is the airspeed the computer uses. If the airspeed I see has got a problem, the airplane's got a problem. And that fact, it didn't get communicated correctly from old team members to the new team members. And if it had, I don't think there'd have been anybody in that room that wouldn't have yelled stop and jumped off the bridge to make it happen. There were errors made. The pedo heat circuit breaker was disabled, but there was no placard in the cockpit to say no pedo heat. And notices of the configuration were sent around, but here also uh, we probably lacked one step, and that is to know that everybody got the message. It's one thing to send it out, it's, to, it's, it's another thing to verify everyone has read and understood it. And so that procedure was changed, by the way, so that people ripped off the bottom of the page and sent it back. I've seen it. Ironically, the X-31 program also may have been a victim of its own success. 
I never saw complacency in this team. I went to tech briefs, crew briefs. It was treated very professionally. And in fact, to some extent, it was treated uh, like uh, an experimental airplane every flight. But certainly you have to think that after hundreds of flights, excellent results. And the fact that none of these hazards, these terrible things that you predict could happen, has ever happened, uh, it could lead you to be less uh, sensitive to things that are happening. Maybe just a little bit of the edge comes off. Those single point failures were identified and we made some actual changes to the design of the airplane to account for that. And again, that was in 1989. Why all those were there and what the concerns were and how to mitigate them and how to worry about them became, we hadn't had any problems with that for five years. And I think again, the complacency just uh, got built into the team. It, it worked fine, we never had a problem. And uh, those little hairs on the back of your neck weren't geared to stand up when people started having airspeed problems. Our control rooms used to have a saying on them to um, prepare for the unexpected and expect to be unprepared. And I think that's the truth in the flight test business that, um, that we need to keep that in mind continuously. We, I, w I wish that sign was still up there because that reminder needs to be enforced all the time. Well, certainly in the case of the X-31, we were returning to base after two exhausting days, seven flights. Ship one was now going into the boneyard, or at least it was being retired from the test program. And so we're finally finished. Is, that, is everybody paying attention like they should be? Obviously not. And while the X-31 program flights were highly successful, they did not include an element that might have helped prime the program team to take the one mitigating action that could have brought the X-31 home safely. We've debated amongst ourselves whether we actually would have been able to convince anybody to use the fixed gain system because there was not an obvious need for it. Uh, the pilot may have been better prepared when things started to, to go awry to select fixed gains, but I don't know if we ever really would have done it in that situation because we didn't have a real problem. We, we did have a real problem, but it hadn't been diagnosed as a real problem. On the previous program, the X-29 program, we had the same sort of thing. We had uh, an analog reversion mode, a digital reversion mode, and the normal mode of the airplane. We routinely at every test point selected those backup modes, flew them around, so the pilots were much more familiar and much more comfortable with selecting those modes. On the X-31 program, we never selected those modes intentionally. We only used them when we had a sensor failure or the, the system told us to select those modes. On the day the mishap itself, there were additional links added to the chain. There were unusual weather conditions that created an uncommon and unexpected kind of flight hazard, and the team was working with a flawed hot mic system that kept the chase pilot from hearing critical communications from the X-31 pilot. So, some links in the chain are already built there. Management links, control room has now talked internally, they've heard some things, they haven't said anything. Uh, some more links are built. We got this chain is building now. The, the chase pilot didn't hear anything about this, didn't know that he had, he didn't know anything was wrong with the airplane until he saw the airplane pitch up and the pilot jump out. Whereas he could have stopped this anytime. At any rate, it's a total team concept and the chase pilot has to be part of that team. The, the team has to have total communication. So the use of a hot microphone frequency that did not allow the chase pilot to stay up with what was going on with the airplane uh, was, was essentially keeping me from doing my job, uh, at least at a certain level. And uh, that's one of the things that we uh, changed in the way we do business here at Dryden uh, is uh, to allow the chase pilots either access to the hot mic or to ensure that all critical communications are transmitted so that all the players are kept uh, up to speed with what's going on. And, and that was a direct fallout of, of how the X-31 operation was handled that day. If one or more of these contributing factors had been caught and addressed prior to January 19th, the chain of events leading up to the accident might have been broken before the flight even took place. Yet there were still opportunities to avoid the mishap, even in the last few minutes of the X-31's flight. 
so why didn't the team manage to recognize, communicate, and respond to the X31's pattern of anomalies in time? So we were seeing inconsistencies between the data from the aircraft system and what we knew of the physics of the problem, that it could not be, you know, that you could not have that airspeed and that angle of attack simultaneously. And for me, I just remember thinking, gosh, I can't wait to, till we get the data from this flight because I want to see what's going on. I knew there was an anomaly. We had talked about it between the engineers. Uh, we didn't talk about it on the intercom, though. We, it was uh, sidebar conversations in the control room. Well, many of us are engineers, and we see an issue. Oh, this is interesting. I wonder what's causing that. And you start thinking about it and trying to figure out what is the answer. In the meantime, the seconds are clicking by. And really, the right response is, something's going on I don't understand. Let's, let's call a halt here and let's just figure it out. We should have, at the first call of an airspeed failure, Puckered it up. Uh, whether you're RTB at that point or not, it wouldn't have changed. The, the, the kind of failure that was occurring uh, should have triggered a lot of emotion anywhere in the flat envelope. In the case of any discrepancy, anything that doesn't sound right, feel right, smell right, let's stop and think it over. And I think that kind of attitude has been uh, built in now into the control room, mission control room uh, processes since then. We were flying lots of flights. Uh, at the peak of the program, there would be days when there would be five flight days. I think on that particular day, we were only doing three flights. That's, that's, uh, and it was the last flight of the day. It was the last flight for the first airplane. And we had completed all the test points for that mission. In addition, we were going through the RTB or return to base checklist. And at that point, every one of us kind of relaxed. Like I said, what was going through my mind is, I can't wait to get this data. Something funny is going on and I want to figure it out. And that's, a, that's another lesson learned that, the, you know, when we talk about it all the time, the mission's not over till the airplane's on the ground and the engine's shut down. And you see it a lot in the control rooms. We start getting ready to land and everybody relaxes a little bit. And that's a lesson I've carried with me is you, you need to continue the vigilance there in the flight. Communication is what it's all about. So everybody, we have to have the communication links. We didn't have it to the chase. Hot mic was a contributing factor. We didn't have it in the control room. We discussed things internally, was not transmitted to the pilot. Uh, we have to have an environment and built where people can speak up when they think something's wrong. They don't have to be right if they're concerned, they should be able to speak, speak their mind, put their hand up, and we stop the train. And then we say, no, you weren't right, it's okay. Fine, we go on. We didn't do that. We never stopped the train. We had a problem and we didn't stop not only testing, we didn't stop flying and come home. But you can't stop for every problem. I mean, that's unrealistic. You have problems in flight. The combination that went with that is we didn't understand the severity of the problem. So you have to understand your vehicle and the consequences of failures. And if one of those failures has a serious consequence, you need to stop and come home. Clearly, there are lessons to be learned in the entire progression of the events that led up to the X-31 mishap. And yet, the X-31 program did not end with that crash. The next chapter of its story is an equally important reminder of why flight test remains such a valuable step in proving a concept or technology, despite the hazards that come with the territory. The X-31 had been scheduled to fly at the Paris Air Show in June of 1995, but after the loss of one of the two X-31 ships less than six months before the show, it seemed an impossible goal. Having lost the airplane, pretty much everyone thought that's it. Because flying the kind of maneuvers that this airplane can do at 500 feet sounded a lot riskier to me after you lose an airplane. Uh, the team really talked a lot about this and decided that it did not want to end this program on a low note. And so uh, they made the decision to press on with the Paris Air Show. A huge thing to sign up for was to take an airplane that just crashed and to turn it around to go do a low altitude high angle of attack flight demonstration. Uh, that took a lot of guts on everybody's part and a lot of good engineering work to make that happen. We actually flew the X-31 84 days after the mishap. This required the board 
to reach its uh, conclusions, to write a report, for the team to react to all of the issues and problems and contributing factors brought up, solve the problem, and get it into an airplane and get it qualified for first flight. It was all done in 84 days. It does tell you about the quality of the team. A totally different airplane, which will demonstrate a most remarkable flying ability. It is the X-31 technology demonstrator. You know, after the, the mishap, the, I think the program made a spectacular recovery and made one of the, the finest appearances ever at the, the Paris Air Show. Uh, the airplane did things that no other airplane could do. The, the Russians had demonstrated post-stall maneuvers with the Cobra. But it was really an open loop maneuver. They pulled back on the stick and, and then you flew out of it at the end. Whereas the X-31 just demonstrated the ability to, to control all axes of the airplane, pitch, roll, and yaw simultaneously while operating at the extremes of the flight envelope. So, fantastic air show. Absolutely the most spectacular I, I've ever seen. And I saw every one of them. And I stood with the crowd on some of them, and I was in the control tower on others, and out right underneath it at other times. But to be with the crowd and watch even hardened veterans, the uh, military, had no concept of what it could really do, and seeing it was jaw-dropping for the crowd. It was spectacular. The announcement that the X-31 was next to, to fly, as you look down the row of chalets, you see all the people coming out of the chalets, out against the railing, uh, to watch the flight. If the events leading up to the X-31's mishap are a reminder of how much vigilance is required in order to mitigate the risks inherent in a flight test program, the X-31's Paris Airshow performance was a reminder of why those risks are still worth undertaking. Flight test of all kinds is inherently dangerous. There are risks involved in it. Never can you or anybody else bring it to zero. Well, you can. That's keep the airplane in the hangar. Don't fly. Well, if you don't fly, you don't move forward. You don't discover. You don't prove things. So you need to take some risks, but you need to do it in a controlled fashion. Now, the reason we spend time on looking at these accidents is that there aren't many accidents. We don't lose many airplanes in, in flight research activities at Dryden. We haven't over the years. And so when you do have one, you better learn everything about it. In fact, you should do the same thing for close calls. The lessons to be learned. Don't assume that they've been learned. We can always, at every new group, will have to learn the same lessons. And you don't want to do it the hard way with an accident. Safety is everybody's business. Flight test safety is everybody's business on the team. And there are no processes. You have to have processes, but there are no perfect processes that will not require good judgment from all levels of the program. If you're a program that's been operating for a long time, potentially, you've got a lot of turnover, you're in your mature years, uh, all your documentation is years old, Maybe you better make sure that all your new people are as good as your old people, that you've reviewed your documentation and it's still correct and you all understand it, and that what you're doing today still makes sense from how you started. So maybe one of those, if you're in that area, you ought to uh, take a look at yourself. It always is clear what, what you should do after the fact, or should have done rather, and nobody thinks it's ever gonna happen to them to lose judgment, to lose this communication link, to, to not do the right things. So what is the message? What is the message for the team? It may mean that I am a part of the chain and that if I don't catch this and if other people don't catch their mistakes, uh, we will run through the entire chain and lead to a mishap. So it means that every individual in the program from beginning to end no matter what the job is, from the highest level job to the lowest level job in terms of detail, uh, they have to take it very seriously. And that's a message that you have to keep 
uh, promoting, pronouncing, and explaining. It sounds trite, but everybody is responsible for safety. If you think some safety office analysis is going to find these the things, they won't. Mishaps can occur everywhere, but the point is you have to fly safely, but fly. Produced by the Douglas Aircraft Company, who gave the U.S. and the Allies the legendary Douglas SBD, nicknamed Slow But Deadly, and the rugged A-20 Havoc, the Stiletto was a unique piece of engineering. It was the sleekest of the early experimental aircrafts of supersonic speeds. The goal of the aircraft was ambitious. It was to take off from the ground under its own power, climb to high altitude, maintain a sustained cruise speed of Mach 2, then land under its own power. The aircraft was also to test the feasibility of low aspect ratio wings and the large scale use of titanium in aircraft structures. Nonetheless, although the long and slim fuselage had the looks to accomplish its goals, the X-3 Stiletto fell short of its performance goals. It proved underpowered to the grand idea of reaching Mach 2, as it could barely get to Mach 1. Its testing, though, gave engineers the insights needed to produce the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. This plane had a similar trapezoidal wing and could successfully reach Mach 2 speeds easily. Today, the Douglas X-3 Stiletto is remembered for its slender look and its ambitious capabilities that distance its design from other iconic Douglas aircraft that were bulky, rugged, and built for intense combat situations. During the 1940s, the jet engine continued to grow as a viable propulsion system for military aircraft. The alternative was rocket power, but these systems were too fuel-hungry and for limited tactical scope concerning fighters or interceptors. The turbojet suffered from some of the same limitations, and this in turn would limit the range and mostly performance of many designs of the post-war period. Consideration was given to hybrid-powered aircraft which retained use of a propeller-turning engine coupled with a rocket or turbojet engine for an increased boost. However, these did not reveal any dramatic performance benefits against the best piston-powered propeller-driven fighters of World War II and thereafter. By the late 1940s, jets continued their evolution to the point that the next major conflict would give rise to the next jet versus jet duels in the skies over the Korean Peninsula. From the Korean War came the North American F-86 Sabre and Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-15 fighters, as well as other well-known types. Despite their sleek designs and jet propulsion systems, these aircraft were only able to reach Mach 1 speeds in a dive. What was sought were aircraft who could perform faster in a sustained way and go beyond the Mach 1 ceiling to stay there. In 1941, supersonic flight was still a point of conjecture, a theory yet to be proven. Just how fast could an aircraft go? Is there a limit? In the years leading up to World War II, the US Army requested that Douglas Aircraft Company study the possibilities of creating aircraft designs capable of supersonic speed. 
the U.S. was about to enter the war, American isolationists had put enough pressure on Roosevelt's government to refrain from joining the global conflict. Nonetheless, the embargo on Japan's expansionist empire was a disguised declaration of war that would detonate sooner than expected. With that in mind, and ever since these Japanese began their aggressive expansion in the mid-1930s, the U.S. made efforts to modernize and grow its military across all branches. The Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Corps began replacing their old equipment and fortifying U.S. territories in Asia if the Japanese decided to attack. No one expected any real threat, but they were wrong. When the Army requested that Douglas design an aircraft capable of reaching Mach 1 speeds or supersonic flights that could break the sound barrier, the company was busy producing the legendary Douglas SBD, or Slow But Deadly. This aircraft would become crucial during the first year of the war, especially in the Pacific, when the U.S. was caught by surprise at Pearl Harbor. From 1941 until the beginning of 1943, the Douglas SBD would be the vanguard of the U.S. Air Corps, fighting off the Japanese Zeros in Midway, Guadalcanal, Tarawa, and the Solomon Islands Campaign. Ongoing modifications made to the company's most effective aircraft, the SBD and the A-20 Havoc, kept engineers away from focusing on experimental aircraft such as the supersonic fighters. The war effort and the fate of the world came first. Sturdy and steady remained the name of the game. The company had to fulfill aircraft requests shipping overseas to the UK, France, and especially Russia. Stalin was desperate to rebuild his air forces after the furious German advance of Operation Barbarossa. In December 1943, when the tide of the war began to slowly favor the Allied nations, the US Air Force again requested aircraft companies to come up with a Mach 1 aircraft. US engineers knew that supersonic fighters and jets were the future of aerial combat. Some designs were successful, but with technology advancing quickly with every new discovery, the U.S. Air Force wanted to take it to the next level. With the sole purpose of getting ahead of the Soviet Union in the arms race, the rising enemy of the decades-long Cold War, the U.S. government was focused on developing cutting-edge military-grade technology before the Soviets did. The U.S. Army and USAF requested aircraft companies to develop a design capable of reaching or surpassing Mach 2 and maintaining such a speed. The result was the ambitious Douglas X-3 Stiletto. In January, Douglas submitted a project for approval, but the program never saw the light. It would not be until June 1945 that the Secretary of War, Henry L. Stimson, approved Douglas's request to develop an aircraft capable of Mach 2 at more than 29,000 feet. The war had come to an end in Europe. New intel gathered from the German engineers gave the U.S. valuable information for further technological advances. The design of the Douglas X-3 Stiletto is the subject of U.S. design patent number 172588, granted on July 13, 1954 to Frank N. Fleming and Harold T. Luskin, and assigned to the Douglas Aircraft Company Incorporation. Fleming led the early effort of putting together the preliminary detailed specifications that now included sustained Mach 2 flight at 30,000 feet for a period of 30 minutes, as set forth by the AAF contract. Douglas began working on an airframe powered by combinations of rockets and jet engines that could produce enough thrust to reach Mach 2. Now known as the Model 499, the research airplane ran into a snag in 1946 when the ARMV's Matriel Command, or AMC, raised concern over the thrust estimates for the turbojet's afterburner. The AMC felt that the estimates were too optimistic, so Fleming and his staff laid out possible twinjet configurations to address this concern. In 1947, plans changed when the Westinghouse Company announced it was conducting tests on a unique afterburner-equipped turbojet called J-46. This allowed the Douglas engineers to drop the use of rocket boosters and focus solely on building their new plane around the J-46 jets. When the airframe design was concluded, Douglas and the USAF signed an agreement on June 30, 1949. This funding provided two Model 499D aircraft, which received the new designation of X-3. Douglas Aircraft was building aircraft with names like Sky Raider, Sky Knight, Sky Ray, and Sky Warrior. 
This was in keeping with the Sky series of aircraft names the company had adopted. These aircraft spanned the gaunt. From a single-engine fighter to a medium-sized jet bomber, the X-3, on the other hand, defied description. The X-3 was to be a breakthrough aircraft, respecting a quantum leap in aeronautical technology, and this may be the reason for the departure from their manufacturer's sky names. The aircraft was named Stiletto. Never had an aircraft design been so visually striking, the Stiletto was stunning from every angle. The airplane exuded speed, it was quite obvious that speed was the intent of the design. The X-3's configuration consisted of a long, narrow fuselage with a high fineness ratio, and two engine inlets high on the center body, beginning just aft of the highly blended cockpit windshield. An empennage assembly was located at the end of an elegant tail boom, poised above the engine exhaust ducts. The fuselage was constructed mainly of aluminium and was designed with three brake points to facilitate maintenance. During the first months, the team at Douglas encountered one problem that would ultimately doom the project. Unfortunately, teething problems with the Westinghouse J-46 power plant surfaced in mid-1948, delaying the X-3 and raising concern with the Air Force. The decision was made to temporarily forego the J-46 and use the service-tested J-34 equipped with afterburner in an attempt to keep the program on track. The underpowered J-34 engine would be used to get both X-3 aircraft up and flying while Westinghouse debugged their J-46. When available, the J-46s would then be installed. The J-46 would have raised the performance of the J-34 from 49,000 pounds thrust on afterburner to 7,000 which would have drastically increased overall power. The team had to make adjustments to the X-3 to fit the J-34 engines and make the most out of it when it came to performance. In 1950, the National Air Advisory Committee for Aeronautics made a series of recommendations to Douglas for improving the aircraft design, which had some flaws that would lead to uncontrolled oscillations. The first aircraft was built and delivered to Edwards Air Force Base, California, on the 11th of September, 1952. The X-3 featured an unusually slender, streamlined shape having a very long, gently tapered nose and small trapezoidal wings. At the same time, the small straight wings were designed for optimal speed at Mach 2. The aim was to create the thinnest and most slender shape possible in order to achieve low drag at supersonic speeds. It was 66 feet 9 inches long, with a wingspan of 22 feet and 8 and a quarter inches, and a height of 12 feet. Weighing 16,120 pounds, the emphasis of the X-3 was on its speed. The extended nose was to allow for the provision of test equipment, while the semi-buried cockpit and window screen were designed to alleviate the effects of thermal thicket conditions. The low aspect ratio unswept wings were designed for high speed and later, the Lockheed design team used that data from the X-3 tests for the similar F-104 Starfighter wing design. Due to both engine and airframe problems, the partially completed second aircraft was cancelled and its components were used for spare parts. The first X-3 hop was made on the 15th of October 1952 by Douglas test pilot Bill Bridgman. During a high-speed taxi test, Bridgman lifted the X-3 off the ground and it flew about 1 mile or 1.6 kilometers before settling back onto the lake bed. The official first flight was made by Bridgman on the 20th of October and lasted about 20 minutes. The performance of the X-3 was mediocre at best. The X-3 had a clunky takeoff speed of 260 miles an hour. During 20 minutes of testing, Bridgman radioed Major Charles E. Yeager and reportedly told him this thing doesn't want to stay in the air. When the demonstration exercise was done, Bridgman touched down at 240 miles an hour to keep the plane stable. He made a total of 26 flights, counting the hop, by the end of the Douglas tests in December 1953. Things did not change much in terms of achieving better results. Despite design tweaks, the J-34 engines were always going to be underpowered even with the addition of afterburners from the solar aircraft. The X-3 reported a maximum speed of 706 miles an hour and a service ceiling of 38,000 feet. The aircraft was difficult to control and it was underperforming in almost every aspect. More seriously, the X-3 did not approach its planned top speed. 
Its first supersonic flight required that the airplane make a 15-degree dive to Mach 1.1. On July 28, 1953, Bridgman pushed the aircraft to its limit and reached Mach 1.2 in a dive of 30 degrees from 36,000 feet. On October 21, 1953, one of the engines lost portions of the turbine blades during a flight test, forcing Bridgman to make a single-engine landing on the afterburner. When the contractor test program ended in 1953, the X-3 was finally delivered to the USAF. The X-3 Stiletto flew 20 times under the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics and the U.S. Air Force. Lieutenant Colonel Frank K. Everest, a veteran USAF pilot, experienced firsthand the sluggish controls at low speeds of the X-3. He called the aircraft, one of the most difficult airplanes I have ever flown. NACA pilot Joseph A. Walker made his pilot checkout flight in the X-3 Stiletto on the 23rd of August, 1954, then conducted eight research flights in September and October. According to NACA spreadsheets, during these tests, the X-3 was abruptly rolled at transonic and supersonic speeds, with the rudder kept centered. These tests would lead to the X-3's most significant flight and the near loss of the aircraft. On the 27th of October, 1954, Walker made an abrupt left roll at Mach 0.92 and an altitude of 30,000 feet. The X-3 rolled as expected, but also pitched up 20 degrees and yawed 16 degrees. The aircraft gyrated for five seconds before Walker was able to get it back under control. He then set up for the next test point. Walker put the X-3 into a dive, accelerating to Mach 1.154 at 32,000 feet, where he made an abrupt left roll. The aircraft pitched down and recorded an acceleration of negative 6.7 Gs, then pitched upwards to 7 Gs. At the same time, the X-3 sideslipped, resulting in a loading of 2 Gs. Walker managed to bring the X-3 under control and successfully landed. After that, the X-3 was grounded for months. The post-flight examination showed that the fuselage had been subjected to its maximum load limit. Had the acceleration been higher, the aircraft could have broken up. Walker and the X-3 had experienced roll inertia coupling, in which a maneuver in one axis will cause an uncommanded maneuver in other two. At the same time, several North American F-100 Super Sabres were involved in similar incidents. A research program was started by NACA to understand the problem and find solutions. Walker made another 10 flights between the 20th of September 1955 and the last on the 23rd of May 1956. The aircraft was subsequently retired to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Although the X-3 never met its intention of providing aerodynamic data in Mach 2 crews, its short service was of value. It showed the dangers of roll inertia coupling and proved early flight test data on the phenomenon. Its small, highly loaded unswept wing was used in Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, and it was one of the first aircraft to use titanium. Finally, the X-3's very high takeoff and landing speeds required improvements in tire technology. Today, it can be appreciated on the museum's fourth floor as one of the first prototypes created to achieve Mach 1 and 2 speeds in the age of supersonic fighters. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds, these visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. 
Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt Me-262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.